You're listening to the Top of the Mountain Podcast with Jimmy Pilato and Rev Coca, presented by the Variety Sports Network and D2Football.com, your home for RMAC football content. Now, to your hosts, Jimmy Pilato and Rev Coca. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back. We are here. Once again, I had to take the week off. I had conferences with school, and it just wasn't going to work out scheduling-wise, so I know we missed a week. We are back here with the Top of the Mountain podcast presented by the Variety Sports Network with myself, Jimmy Pilato, my co-host, Rev Coca with me as always. And uh, as I mentioned, we are a proud partner, uh, member of the Variety Sports Network. Be sure if you want to follow them, follow them at Variety underscore sports underscore subscribe to the YouTube channel. Be sure to follow at FEOTB pod for all of the information, the news uh, going on with this show. Rev, we we took a week off. What did you do with your time away? Did you watch a lot of football, I, I assume, still? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Watched a ton of football, you know. Kind of just getting back into it whenever I can, watching the NFL, watching college, and just really just taking advantage of that time off, just, you know, really doing exactly what we love to do, you know. It never really goes away, that's that's for certain. Never. Uh, is, is your quarterback hopes died yet with Trubisky? Where where are you at? Are you part of the contingent of Steelers fans that want to see Pickett, or are you, are you thinking that they could turn it around? Um, at this point, it's like the Dennis Green quote. They are who we thought they were, kind of how I feel about Mitchell Trubisky. He just is exactly who we thought he was. Like, there's definitely some baseline talent there. There's a strong arm that can show up every once in a while, but that's a problem. It shows up every once in a while. It's not consistent. He's not pushing the ball downfield very frequently. Last week, the offensive line protection was actually good when the criticism was always the offensive line is not great, but – at this point, I just want to see Pickett. You know, if he doesn't show anything in the first half against this Jets game, then we we got to bring in Pickett. Uh, I was about to be kind of in a similar boat to you. What's going on with my team? I was more looking to get move on from the head coach if if things didn't turn around. But the my team got the win that they needed, and now we're going to get through this episode, and then I'm going to go up and watch the end of the Bengals and Dolphins game on Thursday night football. Uh, <clears throat> our division is not necessarily what I thought it was going to be either. I didn't think that – I thought that the Browns were going to struggle a lot more than they are without Deshaun Watson and uh, Baltimore, like M- Lamar Jackson. I hope that he doesn't choose Baltimore just because they were stingy about giving him the contract extension. AFC North is probably – I would say at this point, if I was going to – make a bet on who's going to win, it's probably going to be Baltimore. I wouldn't even say Cincinnati. Yeah, like the AFC North is kind of taking the thing for the arm act, just being completely unpredictable. You see the Cleveland Browns here. The Cleveland Browns kind of feel like the playoff contender that no one is talking about. Jacoby Brissett is is playing surprisingly efficient football and a running game in the offensive line that's built off physicality and beating you up is doing exactly just that. Me being a Steelers fan and watching the Cleveland Browns run the ball down our throats the way they did, you know, they're contenders right there. And then also you have to think about Cincinnati looking to get their rhythm back. I haven't checked any of the scores for tonight yet with Miami. I don't know how they're doing right now, but yeah. They're in the mix. And, of course, Baltimore, Lamar Jackson, he's healthy. He's put on some weight. You know, he, he's he been battling COVID the last couple of years, so he hasn't always been at 100%. But right now he looks amazing. So, yeah, the AFC North kind of been a little unpredictable with Cincinnati having a rough start and Cleveland looking very competitive without Deshaun Watson. But, yeah, similar to the RMAC, like, it's kind of just been like a division full of surprises. Yeah, and, th- and that, folks, is what we call in the business a transition. And before we start getting into the RMAX scores from last week, we are brought to you by Row One Brand at The Cool Stub on Twitter. Follow them and then go to rowonebrand.com. And when you use VSP15, that's promo code VSP15, you get 15% off anything in the art gallery with code VSP15, proud partner of the Variety Sports Network. Go check out rowonebrand.com today. <clears throat> last week, Adams decided to continue the losing streak for Fort Lewis. So we're now inching ever closer to the 1100 day mark without the Skyhawks getting a victory. South Dakota mines, uh, Colorado mines, both get big victories at home. Colorado mines beating CSU Pueblo, South Dakota mines taking down New Mexico Highlands, Black Hills 
in a it it's seemed like it was a thriller. I, I was only getting the live stats for that one. It was right after uh we were leaving the Colorado Mines game, but Black Hills beats Colorado Mesa 31-28 at home in Spearfish. And then Western put on a little bit of a show first time in Gunnison playing on the soccer field. They get a big victory, 56 to 28. Uh first uh, second week of our Mac play turned out to be somewhat a little less competitive than what people were thinking. Uh, Rev, what kind of stuck out to you from just overall general? I know you said the RMAC has been kind of crazy. Uh, is it the South Dakota schools being undefeated? Is it CSU Pueblo maybe not having that sway or that cachet that they used to carry in, in the conference? And what are we going to do about these Fort Lewis Skyhawks? I feel so bad for those kids. Yeah, well, now that you brought up the Fort Lewis Skyhawks, another team to kind of bring up that's also been Floundering and not been extremely competitive in a lot of games is Shattering State alongside Fort Lewis is struggling quite a bit. So it's a bit of a surprise there. Shattering State's usually a middling team. You know, they got their corn fed Midwestern offensive linemen, usually a physical team that'll compete in the RMAC. But a lot of these games are not even within 21 points. They lost by four touchdowns to Western. And that's kind of a surprising thing. But, of course, like you mentioned, the South Dakota teams looking amazing is also a surprise as well. It's just kind of just been, you know, a year full of surprises. Let's just see how these next seven games go. I agree. Uh, I think the South Dakota teams, this is a little bit more – it started off kind of tongue-in-cheek, take your picture being at the top of the RMAC while everybody else is playing tough out of, out of conference competition. You've now gone two weekends in a row playing conference games, and they're still looking – like there's something to deal with this weekend. We're going to figure out which one is more legit because that rivalry is being renewed. We're going to talk about that coming up a little bit later on in the show, but we're going to focus for last week's game specifically Colorado school of mines puts a beating on CSU Pueblo. That's the only way to put it. I was there in person uh, from the opening kickoff. You, you thought that there was going to be some way that the Thunderwolves could get themselves rolling and get some sort of momentum. It just never happened from, from the start 45-17, it was an ugly end of, end of the game score. Um, it was ugly all throughout. It was kind of <clears throat> – I just never seen a CSU Pueblo team get off the bus somewhere and just absolutely look like they're not ready to play. I can't even explain it to you. It, it legitimately felt like when we were getting off the bus back in like 2016, 2017 with Western Rev and just, you know, we, we had almost no expectation of beating anybody except for the other few teams that only had one, one win on the season. It was – it was a rough start for the CSU Pueblo Thunderwolves. Yeah, a rough start without a doubt. The only way CSU Pueblo would have won that game in the first place is to keep things low scoring and kind of make things an ugly kind of defensive stall of a game. And when you see 45 points on the board, you're going to assume that's probably not Pueblo who's going to put up that level of points. You don't, well, you know, Stephen Crow's gone off to a, decent start at quarterback they're probably not going to put up the points that a team like Colorado Mines is so if they couldn't hold them to a certain amount Colorado Mines are both their quarterback and running back being in college for at least 10 years apiece they have the experience and naturally that high powered high charge offense Pueblo just wasn't going to be able to keep up with it is kind of crazy to think about the fact that they do have a decade's worth of college football experience between the two of them and John Matoka and Michael Zimmon. Uh, <clears throat> both, it was Hunter Rackett and Steve Crow played quarterback for the Thunderwolves. A total cum cumulative 125 yards passing on the day. Not going to get it. Not going to get it done at all. Luckily, you only have the one turnover there, so it's not like it was really hurting you. You had a fumble early on. Steve Crow, Steve Crow got sacked for a sack fumble. Uh, it, it was weird though. When you play against Colorado School of Mines, you know they have John Matoka. You know they have Michael Zeman. Why on earth they're letting Michael Zeman run down the sidelines on a wheel route uncovered two times in a row? I will never be able to figure out. I mean, Matoka put up 318 yards and two touchdowns, and it wasn't even like he was throwing in tight windows. The DCSU Pueblo Thunderwolves DBs were not able to cover the Mines receivers, and they're good. They're, they're guys that have some – Deep experience, obviously, Mason Carb, Max McLeod, uh, Josh Johnston. They're all guys that have been there for a while, but they were just – it's one of the most lopsided displays of effort, and and I really don't even know what, what else to say. Like, individually, for, to a man, Colorado Mines was just better prepared, 
and they wanted this game more than CSU Pueblo wanted to try and, and win one on the road. See, Colorado Mines knows that they have to make a little bit of noise now that they have the one loss on the season. So they're trying to put up as many points as possible. And now 40, 84 points the week before against Adam State, and you follow that up with a 45 piece on CSU Pueblo at home. I think the Colorado School of Mines or Diggers are back on track and they're ready for the postseason, honestly. Yeah, at this point, they're on a mission. And like you said, losing those early games kind of earlier on, they realize at this point they don't have room to lose another game or else there's no chance of them sneaking into the playoffs if they lose another one. So, of course, they're going to be a team on a mission. As for Pueblo, a team that's always going to be a physically talented team, something that is missing here is just a def- is a defensive discipline, something that they're usually good with, something that they're usually very defensively stout. But some of the cracks I got exposed – in games against Grand Valley and in games you know, against Colorado Mines is just something that you're usually not used to associating with CSU Pueblo. And like you said, the holes in coverage that are being exploited and the offensive success is just something that you oh, normally don't, you're normally it, not used to. It's one of those offensive line performances that you just got to throw away. It's, it, it was, it, it couldn't keep a single quarterback upright. Like I said, we've experienced it. So it's not like I'm saying this out of out of a place of not understanding what it's like to be on the sidelines there. But I also don't think it does anybody any justice not to point it out. And I think that we can – it's kind of fair to say that the CSU Pueblo mystique that they had built up from the resurrection of the program and winning the national championship and being a perennial RMAC contender, they'll probably always be near the top of the, the RMAC rankings. But I would be hard-pressed to say that they're going to be favorites – in the near future, at least against Colorado Mines. Who knows what Mines is going to look like after uh, Matoka and Zeman finally graduate with their PhDs and, and all of that kind of stuff. But <clears throat> it's just an interesting time for, for Thunderwolves. It's kind of a transition period for, that, for those fans. Uh, speaking of transition period, are you sure? Do we, do we think that the people in Spearfish, South Dakota, have they stopped celebrating so far? When you're 4-0 and on the season, 2-0 and in RMAC play, and you make a 17-point Come back, you outscore Colorado Mesa 17 to 7 in the second half to win that game 38 20, 31 28 without having to go into overtime. And, you know, it's in front of your home crowd. I don't know if they've ever, if they would have stopped celebrating by now. And, and I don't think that I blame them. I think that th- this is a more successful start to their season than they probably could have hoped for. Yeah, so right now, when you look at not only Black Hills, but also South Dakota Mines, they're the only two teams right now on the RMAC with a record above 500. So I'm not going to say that this is as good as it gets for both teams. Like, we really don't know because the RMAC is very unpredictable right now. But I'm pretty sure that both South Dakota Mines and fans of Black Hills stay right now. They're screenshotting pictures of the RMAC schedule and savoring it just in case things get worse as the season goes on. Always waiting for the other shoe to drop. And it's fair to say because Black Hills, the best start that I can remember, it was the last year that we had Eckler. They were undefeated coming into Gunnison. They were 7-0. and We were, uh, I think, 4-3, and three, and beat, we beat them. That was the longest that they had gone undefeated. So this isn't completely uncharted territory uh, for the Black Hills State Yellow Jackets. For Colorado Mesa, though, you, you really got to start wondering. Like You have leaders back on your offense like Hunter Karst. Uh, at quarterback and and these guys that have been here and have been in your program for the last couple of years, granted, it's a little bit new because it's a, a different coaching staff, but you're not getting much production at all so far. And your team has now fallen to one and two and where two weeks ago, we were talking about Colorado Mesa as, you know, they were one and oh, and were ready to move into conference play. And, and at that point they were legitimate conference contenders at one and two right now, it's going to take, a lot of help and they're going to have to win out the rest of their season. And with what their stats and, and the recaps and everything that I've been able to find on their game show me, I don't know if Colorado Mesa is ready to do that. Yeah. At this point, I really don't think so. You can, it's a team like Mesa could assume after all these years of finishing near the upper quartile of the RMAC that they could kind of just roll out of bed and maybe, you know, win seven games, but you ultimately these these games aren't necessarily played on paper. They're good year in and year out, but this year is something different. You know, they've had a rough schedule against teams against Black Hills and South Dakota Mines where beginning 
the beginning of the season, yeah, we were going to say Mesa should be able to handle these games because they have a reputation. Yeah, Mines has played them close a couple of times, but they always find a way to win, and Mines normally will find a way to choke that game. But right now, it doesn't quite look the case, and the Mesa team that is normally one of the you know, stalwarts of the Armac division just – isn't quite that team like and that's kind of a constant theme of just turnaround in this division or in this conference where the Pueblos and the Mesas in which we're normally accustomed to those teams being supreme just that's not the case at the moment and Mesa is just gonna have to regroup after a heartbreaking loss I'm not I haven't fully given up on them they played Black Hill State all the way down to the final minute of the game but it's definitely back to the drawing board for them as a get ready for Western this week. Yeah. And they're going to have to turn themselves around quick. Those are two schools. I mean, right now looking to, it's going to be a statement win. Whoever is able to come out on top, that game's going to be at 6 PM at uh, stalker stadium out there in grand junction. So that one will be interesting. Probably going to keep your eye on that. There's a few evening games. And so you can watch the, the afternoon games. Uh, we have a couple that we're going to mention specifically. I do want to talk a little bit about, um, South Dakota Mines, they are getting unreal levels of production out of their quarterback play. 25 of 38, 333 yards and three touchdowns at the RMAC level. That's damn near perfect. And rushing-wise, as a team, 187 yards on the ground. So it's not like the hard rockers are sneaking past these teams, and they're putting up points. They're able to score with the best of them. They've always kind of been able to do that, and you're just kind of nervous about their defense. <clears throat> this one will be a test. It's going to show – out of the two South Dakota teams, unfortunately, only one is able to uh, move forward and kind of take the mantle. So we will talk about that game coming up here. But first, we are going to mention our friends at In The Clutch Sports. Go to InTheClutchSports.com. You get 10% off your whole order with code Variety Sports. Variety Sports, all one word, and you get 10% off your order at In The Clutch Sports. Here on the Top of the Mountain podcast, Jimmy Plato, Rev Coca, we talked about last week's games. The games of the week that we're going to focus on for week four of the RMAC schedule. First games of October. It's crazy to think that we're already into October on the calendar. We are going to focus on the Battle of South Dakota and Black Hills State and South Dakota Mines of Western Colorado and Colorado Mesa. Both of these are your 6 p.m. starts. Uh, Western going to Grand Junction to play Mesa and Black Hills going to take the 30-minute drive uh, across the highway to get to Rapid City from Spearfish. Yellow Jackets will be on the road visiting the Hard Rockers. Uh, Which one do we want to start with first? we want to go alma mater? Are we going to save uh, the good guys for last, Rev? I think at this point, you have to save the teams that are up top of the RMAC for last and kind of cover the alma alma mater here, Western, going up against Mesa and one of them. Place in which I think is honestly the roughest environment to go in, into the, the entire RMAC. On the sidelines, you're going to have fans yelling stuff at you, throwing stuff at you. And that's, it's always a big game. Well, of course, historically, Weston and Adams is the rivalry to look to. It's the longest rivalry in Colorado history. But in our years there, I don't know how you felt. But during my time there, it kind of felt like Mesa was a bigger rivalry. There was more of animosity between students from Mesa and students from Western smack talking each other. And there's something about Mesa and Western that just kind of feels like it's just bigger. It means a little more. It definitely, when we were there, they were one of the better teams. So we obviously wanted to beat them. It took us up until our last year. We were finally able to beat them and we were the first team to beat them in Grand Junction since 2001. So that was awesome. Ending on a, a walk-off kick with a kicker that we never quite knew if it was going to go through the uprights or not. So go from, oh, my gosh, is he going to make it to a pure jubilation? That's one of the, the core memories that I'll always carry with me from our time at Western. I agree. I I can't stand Adams. I can't really stand any of the other teams in the conference. I guess, you know, Fort Lewis, eh. It, it never really rubbed me wrong one way or the other in the South Dakota schools. I just hated going there because it was a 10-hour drive. Um it's especially we know the rivalry too it's big on the wrestling mat the pifers going at it uh coach pifer for colorado mesa being the dad of western colorado's uh wrestling coach charlie pifer so there there is a lot going into this game i think that's one of the best things about it is yes you're going to grand junction yes it's a hostile place to play i think this is the first time since we beat them in grand junction that these two teams are meeting out there in Stalker, and I think they're getting a renovation in their stadium. 
So you know that they want to close out whatever the way that it looks like now is, is going to be, they want to close it out the right way. And Western Colorado, we've talked about it. They are still in contention for the RMAC championship because they um, are, uh, I believe they're undefeated. Uh, I got to pull up their, this is, this is bad radio, but I believe Western is undefeated in the RMAC play at least. Yeah, 2-0 yes, and two, two in the RMAC. So they are still very much in the conversation for RMAC championship and winning this game in Grand Junction, being able to go two in a row out there, it would be huge for the program. And it would actually, you know, because we were tough on them after their week one loss, they've kind of bounced back and reasserted themselves. This would be that next step forward to go, oh yeah, Jimmy and Rev did know what they were talking about uh, when we were getting ready for the season. Yeah, and... Honestly, something that I'm just looking forward to in this game from Weston is just, well, I just see a little bit of offensive consistency. The running game, having Josh Cummings back, of course, should add more stability to it, whereas some of the earlier weeks you had Damian Macias taking handoffs, and it was kind of a committee situation. So it's, it's good to have your feature back, back in the lineup, and also some consistency from Connor Desch, whereas last week, you know, he was a man on a mission, throwing five touchdowns, but it's just kind of been a bit – of up and down offensive play. And it's going to take a steadier performance this time from the players who you're going to trust the most. Your Connor Dashes, your Josh Cummings, and Kai, Kai Emsley's, the Cole Readers, the Nathan Myers, the guys who are going to get open in their receiving game. You're just going to need something steady here. The defense is always going to be well coached and well disciplined with Coach Hour there, but it's just offense consistency and which Connor Dash is going to show up if they get established to run and so on. They also, too, have been very good on third downs. That was the report I got when uh, they went to CSU Pueblo and took down the Thunderwolves 17 to 10. They were much, much better on third downs, both offensively and defensively, getting the Thunderwolves off the field, and that had to carry over in their 56-28 victory over Shadron. So if they can win those big downs in those big moments, obviously that's what good teams do in, in big-time situations. So Western has a chance to prove themselves to be one of those things. And now that kind of moves us over to the South Dakota side of things. I did look up the all-time rivalry record. Are you interested in hearing who's uh, who leads the all-time series between Black Hill State and South Dakota Mines? Let me hear it. Is it like a close competitive rivalry or just kind of just like a massive gap between, between them? Here we go. It's 65, 60, and 11 all-time, so it is close. Ooh, Only man. five victories separate the two teams. And the South Dakota Mines hard rockers – do hold that five-game lead. Hard Rockers did win last year. Actually, excuse me, Black Hills won uh, the the last game that they played. And for the first time since 1970, Black Hills will be 4-0 entering into the game. And uh, obviously, South Dakota Mines 2-0 undefeated in RMAC play as well. This is the back the Black Hills brawl. That's one of the coolest nicknames of a rivalry game that I can think of, besides maybe the backyard brawl between Pitt and West Virginia. Way better than the Colorado Classic. No, I'm just going to throw that out there. Yeah, without a doubt. There's definitely a little bit of some creativity there, whereas, you know, Colorado Classic like, ooh, this is the longest rivalry in Colorado history. So why not? Let's do Colorado Classic. You know, that's not like something they came up with in two seconds. But without a doubt, I believe last – I forgot what they called the Mesa, South Dakota mine. So I believe last week there was a – you know they initiate a robbery and they call this in like the beef something beef bowl or something. But regardless, yeah, lots of robbery games for these South Dakota teams to look forward to. I wonder, you know, where, where they're coming up with all these robberies from, but regardless, you know, it's cool to have a trophy or something on the line here. And a couple of South Dakota teams here in the RMAC who usually don't quite have as much hope as they do right now. So exciting time to be a fan of either of these teams. Do you worry, though, because this is going to be the most attention, especially since they've been in the RMAC, that one of these two teams are going to face in their games? Uh, is that going to affect how these two teams play against each other? I think you kind of – you obviously expect chaos when it's a rivalry game in college football. I think you also have to expect chaos because it is the primetime, quote, primetime slot at 6 p.m. It's going to be on the RMAC network. There's going to be a lot of people there. It's a close rivalry, and a lot of the guys that play on those two teams are local. So there's probably going to be pack. I'm kind of I'm kind of jealous that I can't make the 10 hour drive up to Rapid City and experience this game because I the atmosphere is going to be electric. So I'm I'm jealous of all the players that are going to be playing out there 
uh, both for both South Dakota mines and for Black Hill State. That's going to be a wild atmosphere. I I can't wait to. I might actually turn that one on on Saturday evening. I I, I really think that it's going to be something something to behold. And yeah, when it comes to these rivalry games, like you said, it's going to be a, there might be tempers that flare, it might be high emotions, and it, especially in in-state rivalry, a lot of a lot of these teams and the players on it perhaps they knew these guys like played against these guys in high school they might have been teammates with these guys in high school now playing against each other so it's going to be you know a matchup full of good old-fashioned hate and you and you gotta love it when it comes to these rivalry games when tempers are flaring it usually comes down to the team that's a little bit more disciplined the team that could dial it in just a little bit better is it going to be the quarterback by committee attack by black hill state that they're currently employing and the seven interceptions they've gotten through four games this year or South Dakota mines in which the heavy, the heavy passing attack with the heavy passing attack with Johansson, that quarterback and the pass rush that's been getting after it. From what I've seen, they've had 13 sacks through four games, just kind of just seeing how they've gotten things done on both sides of the ball. Like who's going to turn out, who's going to turn out this victory. Who's going to be more disciplined. Who's going to commit less stupid mistakes. For to not be as stupid, you'd always kind of lean towards the engineering schools. Yet those kids kind of they play a little bit outside the rules because they're so buttoned down everywhere else. So let's give the people a prediction, Rev. Western versus Colorado Mesa. Who do you think is who do you predict to walk out of Grand Junction with the with the victory? I'm gonna go full on complete homer pick here. And Western has a momentum. They won the last two games. Some of the years before that, Mesa had the edge and just was kind of winning game after game after game. But I think now Western is hitting its form. He had a game against, you know, the game against Pueblo. It was more of a defensive struggle, but they're able to pull it off, execute at the right moments. And like you said, execute on third downs. Not a glamorous offensive performance full on, but they executed when they needed to. Last week, they dumped more points and I believe scored four touchdowns in the second quarter. So I believe right now, Heading into the third week, having Josh Cummings there on the team and the offense kind of hitting his groove and picking things up, I believe the offense is going to continue to look good, continue to look efficient, and execute just enough, perhaps put some put enough points on the board early and kind of sit on the lead and end up with the W. I'm going to be picking Western as well. I think that the momentum of the winning streak and now you know – I mean, I'm sure Coach Baines and the entire coaching staff continues to tell him, if you keep going 1-0, you will keep being in the running for an RMAC championship. So just keep focusing on the one game at hand. They don't really have any room for error to slip up. So you got to go take care of business. I'm sure that they're they're hearing that plenty. Uh, it's always a little bit of a weird trip, but they should be able to get it done. And I'd like i love to see Western get two wins in a row in Grand Junction. Um, so then Black Hills State versus South Dakota Mines, who do you think – uh, who's walking out of the Black Hills brawl with the victory? I believe I got to go with South Dakota Mines here. The offense has been very high powered. The quarterback is playing on fire right now, over 300 yards of or over 300 passing yards per game. And I believe that offensive firepower is going to give Black Hills State their first loss of the season. Expected to be a high scoring affair, but I believe what or um, with the I believe South Dakota Mines. That was actually the team I was going to say. I got a little mixed up there. South Dakota Mines with their passing attack, I believe, is going to be able to get the victory and give Black Hill State their first, their first loss. I'm going to pick the Yellow Jackets. I think that they're one of those teams you can look at and go, they don't even know that they're not supposed to be this good. They don't understand <laughs> that this is unexpected. So with that, I doubt the rivalry game is the game that you want that to leave. I want to see – uh, a crazy madness. I want to see somebody storm the field. I want to watch this game all the way through. I want it to be close and high scoring, all of those things. It's my one of it's the game of the week in, in our eyes. I'm picking Black Hill State. They get the win. They get back on track in the rivalry and they cut that lead. South Dakota Mines currently has to four um, down to five. So we're split on that one. We both have Western beating Colorado Mesa. Before we get into uh, our, our look at the final, the weekly standings here and wrap things up. 
Want to mention once again, we are a proud member of the Variety Sports Network. Follow them at Variety underscore sports underscore. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. If you subscribe to the Far End of the Bench YouTube channel, where you can watch full episodes of this show, Top of the Mountain podcast, every week with myself and Rev Coca, as well as the clips from, excuse me, the Far End of the Bench, you can subscribe here. Follow at FEOTB pod, and you'll keep up with both shows all in the one place. So follow them everywhere. Follow the Variety Sports Network. And now let's take a look at these week four standings. Uh, we've gone through an entire month of football. Black Hill State, number one overall, number one outright, 2-0 and in the conference, 4-0 and on the season. Uh, South Dakota Mines right behind them, 3-1 and overall, 2-0 and on the season. Colorado Mines and Western Colorado also both 2-0 and in the RMAC, and they are both 2-2 two and two overall. So there's your top four. Not surprising except for the fact that uh, – Colorado Mines and Western Colorado probably didn't be, expect to be looking up at uh, South Dakota Mines and Black Hills State. Yet here we are, and uh, the, those are your top four teams in the RMAC so far. Yeah, it's definitely not something that you expected, but also just, like I said earlier, just the records of these teams and a lot of the losses against Texas teams, a lot of losses against out-of-conference out of competition here. So right now it's definitely – not something that you would you would have expected before the season, but yeah, like I said, if you're from South Dakota, you better screenshot this right now. It's you know, it's you know, maybe just, they continue. They put the, they put our podcast on in the locker room, and how much smack we talk just motivates them. That's why they're winning so much. Oh yeah, I'm just adding fuel to the fire. So yeah, I hope someone plays this to them. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Uh, after that, New Mexico Highlands, Adam State both sitting at, at about five tied for fifth technically in the conference. Uh, Adams with a one and three record Highlands uh, one and two, both one and one overall in the RMAC. Then you have Colorado Mesa, UC Pueblo, Shadron and Fort Lewis, all winless in the conference and at various stages of their overall record, Shadron and Fort Lewis still looking for the first win on the season, Pueblo and Mesa, both on a two and three game losing streak respectively. So <clears throat> Shadron and Fort Lewis being down towards the bottom, not surprising. Seeing CSU Pueblo only third from the bottom, though, I can't remember the last time that the CSU Pueblo Thunder Wolves under head coach John Riston have been down this bad. So, yes, it is time to hit the panic button. It's not over-exaggeration anymore. This team is not ready for this season. They weren't ready for last season, and they waited too long to kick themselves into gear. CSU Pueblo fans, it is time to make a stink, cause a fuss. Your team is not playing well, and they don't look like they're trending in the right direction. So might be might be get us a little get a, us in the hot seat a little bit, but I think it's it's warranted, especially with the expectations that they had coming into the season. Yeah, once you look at that section with CSU Pueblo and everyone else there, it kind of just seems like a hodgepodge full of question marks. You know, like who are these teams outside of Fort Lewis, who I believe is the worst out of the bunch? There's definitely some questions here. Like, is Shattering really that terrible? Whereas with Adam State and New Mexico Highlands, are they still just going to be the volatile teams, the teams that could drop a ridiculous amount of points, teams that could be kind of that, that wild card dangerous if you don't take them seriously enough. But, you know, you can score on them as easy as they score on you. And ultimately, they don't have the team discipline to hold up. Is that still going to be the narrative for teams like Adam State and New Mexico Highlands? And Mesa, are they going to keep losing these close games? So... There are so many question marks and kind of just that section of the RMAC that's below 500 at the moment. Whereas the only thing that I kind of feel certain at that section is Fort Lewis is just not ready to compete. I'm not sure what they need. They might need a year off. They might just need to keep wading through it. Uh, but at some, some point, something has to change. But they've been bottom of the conference for the last two seasons, and it doesn't look like that's going to be changing much uh, moving forward. With that – I think that's going to do it for us here. Enjoy the weekend of RMAC football. Like I said, be sure to follow, subscribe, rate, review, all of those good things. Rev, where can the people find you? And do you have anything currently in the works that you're going to be dropping on us anytime soon? That's what I'm preparing. I'm looking to looking to do like some focal points on week four just regarding Pittsburgh's matchup against New York. New York and the Jets just kind of covering, you know, the basics of – Pass offense, what am I looking for? You know, do I even want to watch Mitch Trubisky out there for much longer? Rushing offense in which, you know, I feel like they kind of abandoned after the first half of the Cleveland game. And then, of course, defensively in which I thought they got worn out. 
as a game and on the offense can stay on the field. I thought they got worn out. So I'm just going to kind of cover each and every kind of P compartments of the game and for Pittsburgh and the focal points heading into New York based off of how the previous games went. That's where you can find it. You can find me at, at Rev Coker on Twitter. You could search Rev Coker on Belly Up Sports and find my work there. There you go. Check out Rev's stuff. It's it's awesome writing, and he'll be, continue to be on this show, and he'll continue to pop on to the far end of the bench when there's big MMA news to talk about. Uh, for that, this has been week four of the Top of the Mountain podcast. Thank you all very much for listening. Like I said earlier, enjoy the weekend of RMAC football. Follow us, and uh, we will be back with you all next week. Talk more Division II college football here on the Variety Sports Network. <laughs>